Good afternoon. It's time to move on to chapter 10. And we're going to be talking about mutable objects. And we're going to be talking about some of the objects that are provided in libraries by the Java system. And the first one we're going to talk about is point objects. We're going to have objects for representing points. Now, why do we want that to be an object? Let's say, and I'm going to have to open this up here, my template. We'll call this points without objects.java. So instead of using the one that's built into the point class, let's say I wanted to represent two different points on the coordinate plane. And I just want integers for their coordinates. So I could have integer x1 become, let's say, 3. Integer y1 becomes 4. Integer x2 is 7. And y2 is, let's say, 12. Now, if I wanted to get the distance between those two, I could say, and I'm going to make this a double distance, I could say that's going to be the square root of x1 minus um, x2 not x1 minus x2 plus y1 minus y2 times um, y1 minus y2. And then I could say system that out dot print line of um, And let's just see if I've got that typed properly. And we can run that. And that's what we'd come out with as our distance. And let's say I wanted to write a method where I wanted to find the midpoint between x1, y1, and x2, y2. Well, and at this point, I would have sort of a problem. The reason is because let's say I want public static. I'm going to put a question mark here. And I want to find the midpoint, and I'd give it an int x1, y1, y2, uh, x1, y1, x2, and y2. And then I would say, since we're going to be rounding off these coordinates, I could say mid x is going to be x1 plus x2 divided by 2, and the midpoint y is y1 plus y2 divided by 2. And now, what do I return? I'm stuck. The reason I'm stuck here is because I can only return one thing. Now, I could get around it. I could do something really, really ugly. I could say, OK, let's return an array of integers. And then I could say, integer result becomes new integer two, and I can say result sub zero is middle point X and result one is mid Y. And then I could return result. So when I treat the, um, x and y coordinates of a point as individual variables, I run into ugliness, like having to return two values, but I need to create an array to do it. So I'd have to do something like this. Integer mid becomes midpoint of x1, y1, x2, y2. And then I would say
So this is what I'm doing here. I'm, 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 I'm having actually trouble writing it because it looks just so ugly to me. I mean, it works, but ye cats, there must be a better way. The problem here is that the X and Y coordinates really belong together as a unit. And that's what an object, that's one of the things that an object lets us do. It lets us take different pieces of data that are related to one another and combine them into one nice little unit that we can work with together instead of separately. So when I import the point class from the abstract windowing toolkit, And that's a Java graphics package. And I'm not going to go into any detail on it now. What I can now do is I say, I want to build a new point object that contains both the three and the four packaged together and put that into a variable called first point. I can access the attributes. I can say first point dot X and first point dot Y. And then I can store those in separate variables and I can print them out. And in fact, if I do that, now that doesn't seem too exciting, but we're going to get to the exciting point in a while here. And in fact, listen, they called it blank here, by the way, in the book. Why the heck they called it blank? That doesn't make any sense to me. I think it's a meaningless variable name. And this is why I decided to use something slightly more meaningful, namely first point. Let's see what this looks like. What point is, is an object now, or excuse me, blank, or what I now called first point, refers to a point object that contains both an X attribute and a Y attribute. The parts, the, the variables that make up the point object are called attributes or properties. So that's worth a note, certainly. And I've seen all three of these being used. And depending on what language you're using, they will probably use a different term. But they all mean the same things. These are the object's data. So the object's attributes are the things that an object has. And in fact, in our example, a point object has an X property, we'll call, we'll call it attribute, and a Y attribute. And now I can use those as a unit. Again, if I want to get there, oh, they call them fields. Okay, there you go, attributes. So they're calling attributes in the book good. That's what I'm going to go with. This dot notation says here, go to the object that blank refers to and then get the value of the attribute X. You can also think of it, if you read from right to left, as the X attribute belonging to the object named blank. And then I'm assigning that value to a local variable named X. By the way, in this case, there is absolutely no conflict between these. Um, where was I here? Point example one. Instead of calling them X coordinate, I could have called these X and Y. And there would have been absolutely no conflict. This is the X that belongs to the first point object. And this is the Y that belongs to the first point object. This is a plain old variable called X and a plain old variable called Y that has nothing to do with the object. So the fact that I'm using this dot notation 
there's no ambiguity. There's no conflict between these. But I decided to use different names just to be contrary wise. And in fact, now we can pass objects as parameters in the usual way. And here we can now do our distance much more nicely here. What we can do is we can say public static double distance from point P1 to point P2. And that's going to be um, math dot square root of P1 dot X uh, minus P2 dot X plus point one's y coordinate minus point two's y coordinate squared. And we can return that result. So in fact, let's do this. Let's have our point second point be a new point seven comma 12. And then I can say double distance between points is the distance between first point and second point. And the distance is um, Oh, dearie me, what did I do? Oh, I forgot a closing curly brace. That's what I forgot. And by the way, that distance is exactly the same as I had before. There happens to be a distance method already, but I decided to write my own here just to show you that it could be done. Also, it turns out I did not need to have this um, print F to do this. Let me go into, um, hold on, let me pause the recording for a second here to set something up. So if I import java.awt.point, I can say here point P1 becomes a new point, three, comma four is its x and y coordinates point p2 becomes new point seven uh 12 and then i can say p1 dot distance to p2 and that will give me that and you'll notice that what it printed out here when i print it out it automatically formats it very nicely for me i guess i should do that in here Let's do this and save this as point example two dot Java. And now instead of doing this business here, I'll say first point at, let's do print LN. Plus first point. And then here, my double distance between points is going to be first point dot distance to second point. That's another thing, by the way, that I can now do with objects. So I've got the properties. Mm -hmm. Along with the attributes, an object contains methods. Methods are the things that an object does. And in our example, we can tell a point P1 to give us its distance from some other point P2. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm saying, excuse me, go to the object that first point refers to, call its distance method, and give it the second point to work with. And that will return the distance between the points. And if I compile that, 
and rename it properly. Notice here, it prints out the, I wouldn't say nicely formatted, but at least it gives us the information about what's in there as opposed to arrays, which it certainly did not. Now you'll notice here that I have this distance and that is a method belonging to the object. In the same way that when I had X and Y here, there was no conflict. There's no conflict between this distance method that belongs to first point and this distance method that belongs to my point example two program. But to be clear about what's going on, I'm going to get rid of it. That way, it'll be absolutely unambiguous and guarantee, since it's no longer there, I'm not going to be calling it, and the program will still work. Um, objects as return values. You know, I'm going to go with this in a moment, but let's first go and write that midpoint again. So here was my um, points without objects, and I had to do this really ugly crap to get my midpoint to work. But now I can do it much more neatly with this. I'm going to say, give me the midpoint, which is going to be another point, and I'm going to give it two points, point P1 and point P2, which gives me P1.x plus P2.x divided by 2, and point 1's y-coordinate plus point 2's y-coordinate, divide that by 2, and that's my midpoint x and midpoint y. And then I can return a new point whose x-coordinate is mid x and whose y-coordinate is mid-y. And in fact, now I can say double center is going to be midpoint of first point and second point. And now things will look a lot better. I don't have to fiddle around with arrays or do any weird stuff. Because the point contains both the X and the Y, by using an object, I can return both those values at once. They both belong to the point object that I've created here. And by the way, I forgot to put the purpose of the program here, is show how to access and print point objects and um, show how to pass them to methods and return them from methods. Did I put in a description on this one? No, I did not. Yeah. Is Shame on me, I'm a bad person. What is here in point example one? Class from... We we'll get to represent a Cartesian point with X and Y attributes for the object. There we go, that's much better. So again, um, here is how I pass objects 
to a method and how I can return an object from the method. And they did the object as a return value. They did it with, with a rectangle, where rectangles have an x, y, width, and height attribute. Um, okay, let's do that example here. It couldn't hurt. So let's uh, open up our template file again. This time I'm going to say what my purpose is. Create a um, rectangle object and show its attributes and show that the object is mutable. The attributes can be changed. I guess I'd better import that, hadn't I? So I can say, I want a new rectangle called box, and it's going to be a new rectangle. And what did they do in the book there? What did they call it? 0, 0, 100, 200. So it's at the origin, and it's 100 units wide and 200 units tall. And when we print it, it gives us all the information we need to know, what class it is and what the attributes are, the x, y, width, and height. Now, saying that's mutable, remember that when we were back in with our strings, strings were immutable. So I could not do string, string equals um, However, with most objects, they are mutable. So in this case, for example, I could say box.x becomes box.x plus 5. And I could move the box's y coordinate by adding 10. And let's say I wanted to add width, I want to add 25 units to that. And then I print that. And when I do this, the x and y coordinates have changed, and so has the width. I left the height unchanged. So not only can I use the dot notation to access one of the attributes, I can also use the dot notation to change one of the attributes to some new value. And in fact, here, what they did was they said, let's give it a rectangle and return a point. And what they did there was finding the center of the rectangle. And I'll let you look at the code there and figure out that it is indeed correct. Okay, and I've just shown you that rectangles are mutable. So if I wanted to be able to move a rectangle by a certain amount, I could say move it a dx for delta x and delta y. Let's pop that in here. And then I could say, let's move this rectangle again. And we're going to move the box. And we're going to move it, let's say, 20 by the x in the x direction and 50 in the y direction. Oh, let's make it negative 50 in the y direction. Sure, why not? Since this is the coordinate plane, we can have negative coordinates. And voila.
That's exactly what happens. 5 plus 20 is 25. 10 minus 50 is negative 40. Ah, yes, back to aliasing. When you assign an object to a variable, you are assigning a reference. So when I have a rectangle box 1, 0, 0, 100, 200, and I say box 2 becomes box 1, I'm not copying the data. I now have two references that refer to the same area of memory. And this is really important to understand. Just like when I had an array, when I assigned one array to another, didn't copy all the data. All I got was a copy of the reference. And because I'm doing this, that also means that, uh-oh, when I have something passed into a, a method, when I change one, I change the other one. Um, where is grow? Does, did they have this cut? Okay. I believe grow is built into box. Let me just check something here. Okay. Well, we'll find out in a moment. So let's go and look at this here. Okay. Yeah. So now if I say box two dot grow, let's say, um, what did, how, what did they put it in here? And now I print out box one. Box one should also have changed. And sure enough, notice that the X coordinates have changed and the width and height have changed from 100 to 200, and the height has changed from 200 to 300. Now, how do I know what grow is supposed to do? The answer is, turns out it's built in. And if I were to look for java.awt.rectangle, again, this is a really great site to be able to look at. It's called the Java API, the Application Programmer Interface. We can always look up any class, like rectangle here, and we can see what all of its methods are. And if I say grow, resizes the rectangle both horizontally and vertically. Let me make that a little bit larger so you can read it. So it modifies that it's, so it's H units larger on the left and right and V units larger at both the top and the bottom. And it will also change the upper left corner and the width and height. If you can give a negative value for H and V, the size of the rectangle decreases. And that's exactly what Grow did here. I'm sorry, I'm 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 I'm, I'm I, I, I've slipped a gear this afternoon because it looks as if I'm forgetting to write my plan first before I start writing. And that's probably because I read the book and I said, okay, there's my plan. But still, that's not a good idea. So the, what's the purpose of this program? Show that when you assign um, an object to another object, you get a copy of the reference not a copy of all the data. That means if you change the attributes for one reference, they get changed for the other reference because they're both referring to the exact same place in memory.
Man, yes, um, this is sort of interesting. If you ever want to find out how these things are written, you can actually get a hold of the library source. You can see how java.awt.rectangle was actually written or how um, string and scanner work. Now, they're going to be using a lot of constructs that you haven't learned yet, okay? but it's sometimes sort of interesting to look at them. Um, in fact, so should we do that? Sure, why not? Let's open point.java if I can figure out where it is. Uh, let's see, I think I had a commuter sign 75. Um, where did I put that? I know I unpacked it earlier here. JDK source, it's in java.base probably. Um, let's see here. Okay, I'm gonna cheat, excuse me. Excuse me while I cheat and figure out where it is easily. Ah, it's in Java Desktop, Java AWT. Okay, thank you. So Java Desktop, Java AWT. And here is point.java. And you'll see that all the documentation for it is there. And you'll notice it has an integer x and an integer y. And then here is how we build a point. And I'm not going to explain that because that's part of chapter 11 at some point. Um, but here, for example, is how do I move something to a specific point? Or how do I translate it with a delta X and delta Y? And they do pretty much the same thing that we were doing. But this is the internal representation of a point. So if you ever wonder, gee, I wonder how Java implements some stuff, you can actually look it up. It's all there. It's open source. So how cool is that? Now, one thing that's incredibly important to know is we can document things, what the attributes are and what all the methods are in this big, long business here. Oh, let's go back to point if I can find it here. Um, is this point? No. This is point again. And here where we have the fields and what they are and the constructors and all this other mm -hmm. razzmatazz. Turns out you can also draw diagrams that condense a lot of that information so you can see it at a glance. And this is something called Unified Modeling Language, UML. And so here are the class diagrams for the point and rectangle class. The UML diagram always has the name of the class at the top, point or rectangle, and then it has the attributes so the attributes of a point are its x and y. Now, notice this is totally backwards from the way that we do things in Java. Remember, in Java, we have to do things like integer x and integer y. Whereas in UML, we say x is an integer and y is an integer. So in this case, the field name comes first and the data type comes afterwards. So <laughs> something to be aware of. What does this plus mean? The plus means that it is publicly available. That means that the word public has been defined when we define the attribute. Again, in chapter 11, we're going to see this when we define our own objects. And here's the rectangle, which has the x, y, width, and height attributes, all of which are integers. Then we, underneath the attributes, we have the methods. We have a method for building a point that's called a constructor. 
and the two string method. For rectangle, we had two string, we had the grow and translate, which means move the rectangle from one place to another. And again, you'll notice that the variable name comes first, then comes the data type, and the return type comes at the end, not near the beginning. So in Java, we say void grow of um, int. What would what, what, they call those here? Sorry, I got to look here. Whereas UML says grow um, takes DX, which is an integer, and DY, which is integer, and returns void. So every, every, everything just goes in the opposite direction. And that's just the way it is. Again, plus is public, minus identifies private, and we'll discuss those in chapter 11. This is a really good place to stop right now. Uh, what I may do is come back in later today or tomorrow morning and do the rest of chapter 10 so that tomorrow afternoon or tomorrow evening rather, I can pick up and start on chapter 11. I need to get a little bit ahead of the game as I was saying earlier this week. But this should give you something to think about for now. And I will see you at the next mini lecture, whenever that happens to be.